Okay. Well, I'm going to go ahead and get started just because I know folks will be wandering in, but I want to give our speaker as much time as possible. Thank you all for joining us for the inauguration of the fourth year of Idea Factory, uh, which is a big accomplishment. I'm pretty pleased with that. Um, if you were at our last talk, you would have seen that this year uh, our talks a big, are moving forward. We're moving the, for the series forward by having all of our talks address a theme, a single theme. And so in the spring, we put out a call for proposals on the theme of walls. Uh, which we believe is a capacious enough topic uh, that it opens up many pathways for inquiry. Um, as we noted in our call for proposals, walls bind and exclude, they support and divide, they persist and transform. So we asked our speakers to think about the concept of walls and, and metaphorically, literally, historically, figuratively, aesthetically, architecturally, you name it. Um, and I'm very pleased to see that to say that we have a really uh, excellent schedule for you. So I wanted to give you the year, uh, the rest of the year's talks now, um, and give you a sense of what we're going to be doing. Uh, our next talk is November 14th. Room still to be determined, but please note that in a departure from our normal schedule, it's actually going to be on a Tuesday. And we have John Matsui from the University of California, Berkeley. Who there is going to be talking about walls as barriers of access, uh, specifically in STEM and underserved and underrepresented uh, minorities. We have our own uh, Professor Vivian Cal, uh, who's going to be talking on December 7th about actually following up very nicely with John Matsui's talk, I think, in terms of how composition can become a barrier of access uh, for students in STEM institutions. Uh, on January 18th, we have an Italian scholar coming in uh, who is an archaeologist who's going to be t obviously has some walls on the mind, which is going to be quite fun. Uh, Steve Coy on February 1st uh, talking about the wall as an aesthetic medium, um, since Steve is himself a muralist. Uh, March 15th, Annie Bulletin, a PhD candidate from the University of Michigan, is going to be talking to us about the poet C.D. Wright. Where's my C.D. Wright reps in the house? Yes, yes. Uh, we're talking about C.D. Wright in my class this semester. But C.D. Wright uh, is a contemporary poet who talks about borders and border crossings in her work. And then finally, as an added bonus to end the series, Ken Cyber, the mayor of Southfield, is going to be presenting at Idea Factory, talking about a sort of personal historical project that involves an ancestor which, with what we'll say a colorful past which involved some wall breakings in the forms of prison walls. Uh, so we're going to keep that hanging out there and hope you can make uh, that particular talk. So we're very excited uh, for this year. I think it's going to be a really wonderful uh, series. Uh, a special thanks. Uh, all this happens with a lot of work um, and also financial support. So we have been uh, gracious beneficiaries of um, the College of Arts and Sciences uh, funding as well as the Department of Humanities, Social Sciences, and uh, without further ado, I will turn it over to uh, Steve Ross, who will be introducing today's speaker. Just in time. Thanks, Paul. <sighs> Gotta catch my breath from running across campus twice in 15 minutes. Uh, so it's, it's my uh, distinct pleasure to be um, introducing Andrea Ice. And full disclosure, I've known Andrea for 30 years. Oops, I probably shouldn't go there. Almost 40 years. Well, well more than that. Uh, what? Life. Uh, we're married. We're a couple. Uh, so, uh, so I'm intimately familiar with her work, and um, but I'm going to let her uh, speak to that. Uh, I think it's worth uh, noting that we did meet in art school, and uh, we both came to um, art school from two totally different perspectives. Um, I had a degree in uh, business administration with some engineering, and Andrea has a degree in archaeology and classics. And, uh, so, we, so we'll this will probably un, be un, un, unraveled in her uh, presentation. Uh, Andrea was born in New York City, which she's very proud to uh, speak of, but, but moved to New Jersey, and, and uh, but spent uh, much of her 
childhood going in, back into New York City and visiting uh, museums, in particular the Museum of uh, Metropolitan Museum of Art. I don't know if you're going to talk about yes, that. Yes, I am. So you can pass that by. Okay, I'll, I'll pass. <laughs> but, uh, and so these are the things that I had the pleasure of learning about while I was getting to know Andrea and her family. Uh, she, uh, she moved from New Jersey to uh, the far west of the Midwest, um, Beloit College, which is a small liberal arts school in uh, Wisconsin, southern Wisconsin, uh, where she did study uh, her, her passion of uh, classics um, and archaeology, learning ancient Greek, modern Greek, and that we I'm sure talk about in a minute. Uh, Andrea is well-traveled, as some of you in the audience uh, have traveled with her. Um, we just spent some time in Paris, where she then went, used that as a departure point to go back to Greece, where she's traveled many times to do more research and collect more images. And uh, that will be embedded in her talk, I'm sure. She is, she works, she teaches at Oakland University. She's now the director of the film studies program. And uh, but prior to that, she, she was hired in, in art and art history, uh, where she taught courses on um, uh, studio arts and art, art history, pre-Columbian art, history of Native American art. And, uh, and all of this is just to say that she's a, a woman of many, um, I don't want to say talents, but many interests and passion. Um, in the academic world. Um, I think uh, well, she's also um, a collector of art and lots of stuff. And I don't know if that'll be. No, that's not part of this. <laughs> and, uh, and I have to have a sense of humor. <laughs> and so with that, um, I'll give you Andrea Hives. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to get on the other side of the cord so that I don't trip over it. Um, okay, I, no, let's get out of this and into my, I have a short PowerPoint and then I have two short films to show you. And so, okay, so, um, I will say that, that I don't think of myself as a person who does art or makes films about walls. Uh, but once I started thinking about the theme, I found that it actually has been a large part of the way that I respond to things. Because I travel a lot to Greece. I look at the ancient sites. There are a lot of partial walls. There are a lot of walls that are cobbled together out of other things. And they have infused my art in ways that I didn't even think about until I started thinking about it thematically for this presentation. Um, so just a little intro. Steve gave away some of my points, but that's OK. <laughs> Um, this, the title, Emerging from the Stones, Mycenaean Walls, Strong Women and the Power of the Imagination. So I'll deal with the subtitle in a minute, but the title came from this quote. And this is what I learned up there, that the Parthenon was not a thing to study but to feel. I hadn't expected a human feeling to emerge from the stones, but this is what I found. It's a quote from Don DeLillo in the names. Now, I don't totally agree with this quote, because I do think that the Parthenon is something to study. However, if all you do is study, of it, study it, and you don't get to that part of feeling it, you've missed out on so much of what really makes it powerful and still relevant. The same is with all of Greek uh, culture, I think. So uh, this was me when I was doing my study abroad um, a long time ago. Uh, and uh, at that time, you could actually walk into the Parthenon and sit in the middle of it, which is where I was. Uh, now you're not allowed anywhere near it. You, you have to keep your distance. Um, so you can't have that kind of experience. I knew it was an amazing experience at the time. Sometimes you, you don't think back on that until later. But this had been so important to me for so long by the time I got there that 
I, I felt the, how wonderful it was to be able to, to feel this. Um, however, I did turn away from classics and archaeology. So after getting my BA in those and going to a year of graduate school, I thought, well, maybe not. Um, and I eventually went on to art school. And um, I got my BFA, as Steve said, at the Minneapolis College of Art and Design. And this, um, and I know it's a little bright in here, so I'm not sure how well you can see some of this. But um, this is one of the, it was a very large 40 by 60 photograph, um, an actual photograph, not digital print, um, done in a dark room, of, uh, from my thesis show there. And my thesis show was both uh, film and photography. And what I'm doing is carrying my, uh, my album, my photo album from when I was in Greece. And that's the picture there that I showed you here. So I was carrying my past around with me and trying to shine a light on it. But I was hiding behind the light. There were all sorts of things going on. But I didn't know what I could do with the fact that all of that Greek background was still so important to me. Um, so getting back to why this image is on the poster, actually, um, this connects to uh, a quote. Would that it were the king of Asine, we've been searching for so carefully on the Acropolis. Oh, I'm, I'm off by a. Um, sometimes touching with our fingers his touch upon the stones. Um, that's a, a, poet, uh, a Greek poet, George Ferris, um, from the King of Asinae, the Iliad. And Asinae was a Mycenaean city that um, it's named in the Homeric catalog of ships. And um, it's, it's about 30 miles from Mycenae. Uh, so it, it connects to a lot of the things that will be in my films and stories. But that idea of touching with our fingers his touch upon the stones is exactly what is most internally powerful to me. And it has been for a very long time since I went to the Metropolitan Museum of Art. As a 10-year-old, I go every Saturday. My parents would drop me off, and they and my sister would go somewhere else. I still have no idea where they went while I was sitting there in a darkened auditorium watching slides of archaeology sites. Um, and I'm going to have to read this to you. But um, I eventually wrote a letter to the editor of the New York Times about this, which they actually published. Um, I, didn't, I didn't give you the, the image with their little, they put a little cartoon drawing with it of a little boy looking at an archaeological site. So that's not here. But so, um, and they also titled it, A Child's Wish to Touch Antiquity Once. I would say many, many times. I wouldn't say once, but anyway. Mm -hmm. So I'll just read it, because I know you probably can't see it. Um, to the editor, learning that the Egyptian reliefs at the Metropolitan Museum of Art would be temporarily without their protective glass uh, sent me back to fifth grade when I attended the Met's archaeology lectures for young people. After every lecture, I walked through the tombs, the pyramids, um, intrigued by the tall, tight spaces and elegant, mysterious figures. But I also stared at that protective glass and that spot way above my reach where the glass stopped. I was determined to become an archaeologist so I could reach above the glass, so I could legally touch some fragment last touched thousands of years ago. This desire kept me going through college and graduate study, but I decided to become an artist instead. Maybe it was the images behind the glass that were really most important to me, or maybe I just found another way to be able to touch art. So this idea of touching what had last been touched thousands of years ago carries with me every time I go to Greece. Unfortunately, there's not a lot of touching you can do anymore. Um, since I am not an archaeologist, I, I have to see things from the other side of the fence. And I'm not allowed to touch those wonderful things that I would love to. And I understand why. I, it's not that I think everybody should be able to touch all of those things. We destroy them. Um, uh, so 
you probably can't tell it all, but um, this is this is from the Acropolis, looking through the walls that surround the top of the Acropolis and the little little area where you can look down onto the placa. So sometimes I look through the walls. Sometimes I look up at them. This is a is also on the Acropolis, and I don't know that you can tell, but. This is a wall that's made up of lots of fragments of walls from lots of different periods of time. And these two, I think you can tell a little, little better in these two. Um, this one where they've turned the, the parts of a column that had fallen, they turn it on its side so it can make a wall. Um, and this one with the, the uh, capital to the column stuck in, fitting perfectly into the wall to help continue to hold it up. So I'm not even looking at my notes, so I have to see where I am here. Um, so uh, I'm, I'm really fascinated by this insertion of the past into the present. It's chaotic. It's unexpected. It doesn't show a lot of reverence, oftentimes, for the past. Um, but it becomes a, a presence that's everywhere. And in Athens, you see these kinds of walls everywhere. Um, so, you know, sometimes the walls were for keeping people out. Sometimes they were to give people a sense that they were safe. Um, it's very hard, really, to understand the value of the past in the present through these, these ways of thinking. I do have one more that I'll just show quickly, is that somehow, sometimes the present comes into the past, so it's the opposite. Uh, direction and um, usually it's pretty prosaic and practical. Let's like make sure this still holds up. Um, but I'm interested in more than this. These are just pictures that I took that I, I realized when I went through my photographs for this that I had lots of photographs of walls. But I had to think about why did I photograph that wall and what about it was interesting to me. But this is really what's more interesting to me. Um, another quote from James Merrill, who spent a lot of time in Greece, a poet and a novelist. All through the countryside were old ideas found lying open to the elements. And that's really what is, is central to me, is that these fragments, these architectural fragments, these physical fragments, they are ideas to me. And so my films are a way of bringing that forward. I did do it, the last slide I'm going to show, I did do it, which you can't tell very well. But this is at Mycenae, and you'll, you'll see so, something similar in one of the films. But this is the palace at Mycenae. And you're looking over the Megaron, which is the palace, the, the um, throne room. This is, this is a circular hearth. There's column bases. There are four column bases around. There's a threshold the wall that they've reconstructed, which comes significantly into one of my films, and looking out over the Argolid Plain. So this is where Agamemnon was king. Um, this area here, you can't see it well in this image because there's a lot of trees and foliage, but this is where they think there was a bath. And the bath is where Clytemnestra killed Agamemnon when he came home from 10 years in Troy. There's a lot of backstory there. It's in the film. But what that means is when you stand here, and there's tiny little words up there. It's bigger in the actual image. But it says, she waited here for his return. That's, to me, about the power of imagination. That's about me putting myself into this place and thinking about these people who existed there, who lived and died and loved and hated and were, were people like we are. Not visibly in their external structure or the way their lives work, but in their human emotions. And so that's what I try to connect to. So um, all right. Now what I'm going to do is introduce one of the two films. There are two films, they're short films. Um, uh, so the first one we're going to watch is Penelope's Odyssey. The, this one's the longer of the two films. It's 14 minutes long. 
Um, it, it's based on, um, on Homer, based on the Odyssey. However, I would pick and choose elements out of the Odyssey that connected to Penelope rather than, rather than Odysseus. So the, it's called Penelope's Odyssey because it's rethinking the story of the Odyssey and the idea of Odyssey from Penelope's perspective. Now, for the 20 years that Odysseus was gone, um, she did rule in his stead in Ithaca. And she also had to deal with that length of time, be, not knowing what was going on with Odysseus, being uh, surrounded by suitors who said, he must be dead. You should remarry one of us. And the, the loneliness, the struggles that she experienced, what I've tried to do with this film, and I want to talk about it a lot more before I actually show it to you, but is to structure it in a way so that you feel her changing emotions through the years. So it's set up in year segments. There are not 20 of them, don't worry. But um, we, each one is edited differently, shot differently, has a different feel for what she might have been experiencing in that particular year. Um, the walls come in, into it as a, um, it, only in some of the sequences, but I felt it was better to show you the whole film to get the sense of it. But sometimes they're oppressive, sometimes they're pushed back against, sometimes they're a measure of connection. Um, so there are all of those ways in which you'll see also, because the, the image of the hand against the wall, that's from this film. And you'll see the way the, the, the physical connection works. It's all, also about something that T.S. Eliot called the objective correlative, in which you find a way through an object or something physical or something visual to suggest an emotion. So it correlates to the emotion. That's the, the quick version of it. Um, and I use that constantly in my films. So my films, there are, Penelope appears in this film, played by two different people. One of them is me. And, but she never speaks, so there's no dialogue. But there are lines from Homer um, that, get, that keep you moving through the story. So I'm not going to say a lot more about it. I'm just going to show it. It is a little, I mean, well, it's a lot. Unfortunate that. Um, you, you won't be able to see this very well because it's really bright in here. Um, but uh, hopefully you'll, you'll get the general sense of it. You may not be able to read the Homeric quotes. Hopefully you can.
Okay. So that's that film. The, the second film is quite different, so I'm just going to take a minute to talk about this one before we watch the next one. Um, this one, I think as you can see, all the, 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 there are a lot of changes that she goes through, Ho as hopefully you can see anyway. <laughs> there are a lot of changes that she goes through um, emotionally through these years and the, whether uh, the images get very tiny when her, her world has been constricted down to, to what usually is a comfort, a, a crackling fire is so far away from her that she can't even really connect with it or she tries to control her world through, through uh, straightening the, the blanket on the bed, or she pushes back against her immeasurable fears. So that's, the, that's pushing back against the wall. And yet at the same time with the repeated push, she ends up connecting through that wall to what could be a variety of ways you could imagine that connection. But these sorts of things are ways that I can take something that's out of the past and bring it into my present and hopefully make the, the story relevant to the present. By changing it to Penelope's Odyssey, she journeys, she never leaves home, but she journeys uh, similarly to Odysseus. Um, I do have my feminist take at the end because Odysseus waits for Penelope at the end. So she's, she's got to finish her traveling, her journey. And, and Odysseus waits for her. But the thing is, that's in Homer. Those lines are there in Homer. They get passed right over a lot of times because it's just a couple of lines where he stands and looks down, he stands leaning against a column and he waits for her to speak, waits for her to accept him as the man who left 20 years ago. So it's not as if I'm not finding it in the text and that's very important to me that I found it in the text in, in uh, Homer and got back to my roots by actually um, doing the translations myself for all of those lines. Um, but. For me, it's, it's all very much about re-energizing our experience of the past, our knowledge of the past, and the idea that the past can be relevant to what we ourselves are experiencing. Um, I don't know if anybody wanted to ask a question on this or if you just want to go to the next. The next film is totally different, much shorter for one thing, but it also inserts me into the film. I talk about it as, as kind of, I give a voiceover as the artist, really. So maybe we'll just, you know, going, and walls are everywhere and crucial and critical to this one. Um, so, this. <coughs> I think I'm going to try to turn the sound up a little bit because. There's a lot of talking in this one, and it's four minutes. And I want you, hopefully I won't blast your ears off, I'll come right back to it and you know, check. Archaeologists have determined that this is not the tomb of Agamemnon. I understand that. It's not that I don't get it. Can't, Can't you, you just see, see Clytemnestra there? there? Can't, Can't you, you just, just imagine her having, her having them clear, clear the, the dirt, dirt from, from the path, path having, having them pull open, open those, those doors, doors, having, having them, them push aside, push aside that, previous that previous king, king who was powerful, as powerful as Agamemnon, but just a man. And so he died. She could have, could had, have him had him pushed, pushed aside, aside and had the floor swept and, had the floor and made, swept ready, and made ready for Agamemnon. 
for Agamemnon. She would have known that he was going to come home, that he was going to see those mountains just beyond that. he was that going to know that Mycenae was view just beyond that view. Was Mycenae. And that she and would be there. That she would be waiting. There. But well, really, it was more that really Mycenae would be. It was more that, that Mycenae his kingdom would be, would be waiting. That that his kingdom, his power would, would be, be waiting. waiting. That his she would have known power that it didn't matter would be that waiting. she was there. Signals announcing her husband's impending return meant that once, once again, again he would occupy he would throne. occupy this seat. His frame would more his frame would more adequately fill, fill the massive stone seat. His, his footsteps, footsteps would, would echo, echo more, loudly, more loudly through the palace. Until then, though, this room belonged, belonged to her. She had held the power at my seat. She had held the power at my for far too to long to simply turn it back over to the man who had so, so easily, easily served, served up her, her daughter. daughter to the gods. The south side of the Megaron, where archaeologists think Agamemnon's throne had stood, it all crumbled, fell into the, fell ravine. Into the ravine. The stone, the stone seat, seat, the beaten earth the floor, beaten earth floor that whole, side, that of the whole Megaron. side of the Megaron. Perhaps Clytemnestra knew that her stare over so many years of waiting had loosened the supporting wall. Perhaps Clytemnestra knew that if she waited, her, her act, act would, would prove unnecessary. unnecessary. She stared at that mountain beyond that room, listening for the rumble of the collapse. Actually, strangely, I what? I could not follow that. I'm, I'm sorry. That's okay. I'm the only one with that problem. But especially with the low echo effects. Well, and I will say one thing that I was going to start out with is this is actually not the final edit. I did re edit it and take out some of those echo effects, but well, not, not all of them, because they're there because of, they make it difficult for you to hear. Um, that's part of it. Um, but I apparently copied the wrong <laughs> version of this film. It's, it's pretty close to what it was, but there were a few parts where it did get hard to hear where I had taken out one of the echoes. The echoes to me are kind of important. Um, I, I don't think that the past actually speaks to us clearly, and I don't think that we all get the messages, and so, Originally, I, I did this with just one soundtrack, and then I wasn't sure if that was the take of the, of the voiceover that I liked the best, so I decided, okay, I'll put in another one, and I'll mute that one, but I won't take it out yet, but I forgot to mute it. And so all that doubling of sound originally was a mistake. So you decided you liked it? I did decide I liked it. I will tell you that Steve doesn't like it, oh, yeah. and he has complained totally about it. <laughs> I think it totally works on many levels. It could be the whisperings of the past. It could be mm -hmm. the fact that you can never have this one thought in your mind, that you have these competing ideas. And yeah, I, I definitely think it works. Yeah. And I think, you know, that this is totally valid that they're going to be completely opposite opinions on this. Um, my films are art films, and they're experimental, and they. Um, they do often uh, challenge the audience. <laughs> and that's part of it. I mean, I do intend that challenge. Um, and maybe 
that means that ultimately sometimes someone will not connect with it, will not understand it, and although I would prefer if people did, I do understand, I, I accept that because I think it's part of how I work. Um, and I, I have actually reasoning behind every single formal choice that I make. I'm not going to tell you all of them because I, we would be here for years. But um, nothing is, even though that was a mistake that came out of a mistake, it didn't stay in because of a mistake. It stayed in because I started thinking about, well, first, it sounds kind of interesting, but what does it mean? Is it right for form and content for me have to be totally connected? Um, that doesn't mean they're necessarily clear connections of the form and content. But for me, it's about feeling as much as knowing. And sometimes you can't know, particularly with something out of the past or anything that you might have experienced. And you might have experienced it differently than someone else. Um, this is a retelling of the Clytemnestra story. She's often the most evil one in the story um, because her husband, the, the war hero, comes home and um, uh, you know she's, she's all nice to him at first, and lures him into the bath to take a nice warm bath and then throws a net over him and stabs him to death. Okay, well, yes, that is truly evil. This is true. However, go back 10 years. They, the, the, there's a whole story with gods, of course. But the winds were stilled, and they didn't have, they didn't have winds to, to go to Troy to rescue Helen, who had run away with or been captured by, abducted by Paris. So Agamemnon sacrifices his daughter, their daughter, to get winds so they can sail to Troy. So before all this, 10 years ago, he kills their daughter so that they can get the winds to sail to Troy. Um, there's, a, there's some reasoning behind her anger. Now, that doesn't mean you want to justify what she did, but you don't want to justify what he did either. He, he is not Mr. Perfection. He comes home with a mistress and two children. And, you know, uh, th there were underlying issues. Now, I'm not trying to justify her actions, but what I'm trying to do, the, the way that I set this up in terms of storytelling, was that her gaze, and I'm very interested in, in theoretical issues of the male gaze and the female gaze, which is a big thing in film. Um, and so in, in my version, she was so angry that she just stared so long at that wall where the throne was that she made it crumble. So she wasn't really at fault for his death because he just fell off. Um, so this was my way of getting around that issue. I didn't really want her to kill him. Um, but these are, this is, this is about the Mycenaean walls, because that's actually Mycenae there. This is about, about strong women, both Penelope and Clytemnestra, and it's about the power of the imagination and how you can rethink everything while still connecting it to what the Greeks said and thought and did. And you can do that through the physicality of the space. The um, curved wall there, that's the so-called Tomb of Agamemnon, which as I said, that's what archeologists say, that's not true at all. But I could just imagine it, that she would go in there. And this is one of the few places that if you get there at the right time, you can be totally alone in this tomb of Agamemnon, and you can walk those walls. So that's what I did. I just walked and I kind of walked around and around and around the inside of the tomb. And, and that's where, even though it showed up in supposedly in Ithaca, in Penelope's Odyssey, that's where the hand touching the wall is from because there's no one in there. There's no guard. You just are there, you and the past. And, my imagination got set free by that space, by the physicality of it, by interacting with it. And so that's how it came into this film. Can I interject based on the comment about the echo? And yes. That a little bit? Didn't the echo just begin when you were in that space? And so it gave that 
even though you gave us a close-up of that space, you showed us the curve, I know it to be extremely volumetric. Yes. Volumetric. And so I, every time I heard that echo, I was reminded of that space. It it, yeah, it is a very echoey space. And it is very like, I mean, it's like, I know, t at least twice as tall wherever you decide the top of this room is. Um, it, and so it, it does have that kind of a sense to it. But I mean, I still, I wanted to be upfront about that it was a mistake that there was an echo, but, but it does connect um, in another way. Yeah. Yes, but then you have to read. Yeah. And um, I, as you can see, reading was very important in the first film. Um, and this, I didn't want it to be quite that way in this one. But I understand that, that approach to it. Um, there is actually a point in this where I say two different things. Where I say that um, when Agamemnon comes home, his frame would more adequately fill the, the uh, stone seat. And one time when I was reading it, I said, the golden throne. And that was just, I don't know why I said that. I mean, I meant to say stone seat, and I said a golden throne. But um, so I did leave that in, but it's so covered up that you can't tell. I can tell it's there, but you, you probably wouldn't notice it. Um, but some of this is, is really, to me, an acceptable confusion. And I know that can be frustrating. I, I, I totally understand that that's frustrating. But it wasn't totally about you knowing exactly what was being said all the time. When, and the, the newer edit um, is, is slightly clearer when I think that I want to make sure that people hear that particular line. But, yeah. Uh, um. I will start with an observation, then it will become a question later. Uh, I was interested very much when you said that when you told us the story about the letter that you wrote in the New York Times about the uh, uh, need to touch mm -hmm. the walls. And then um, for all the movies, for both movies and, and all the images that you showed us, uh, there was this need of touching yes. and this distance. Uh, when, there, when the thing was small, it's because you are physically distant. Mm -hmm. But you know, from a, a visual perspective, if the thing is big or, or small, it yeah. uh, doesn't, doesn't matter very much. Mm -hmm. right? Actually, uh, in psychology, they, they told us that this is conceived like a, a shape constancy. Right. You have the same thing if yeah. it's big, it's small, it's yeah. large, it's deformed by perspective. You know that this is the object right. like it is. Right. But uh, this distance is actually, that, that you put in your images, seems to be very much related to touch and physicality, like to yeah. express that, yeah. right? And uh, I also love this a lot of manipulation of objects. Mm -hmm. right? yeah. So, yeah. you know, jewelry and th like physically touching things and, mm -hmm. and uh, and um, um, fabric yeah. at the beginning, the sound yeah. of the fabric. Mm -hmm. So there is, there is this very tangible, literally tangible yes. feeling uh, um, uh, uh, that you transmit in your movies. Um, but then now I have a question because I'm yeah. very much interested in the aesthetics in different senses. I'm trying to do experiments on uh, uh, if there is a pure sense of uh, aesthetics in touch. So we are uh, actually asking people to touch um, three-dimensional shapes uh -huh. and to evaluate the beauty of these objects. Oh, uh -huh. And um, so my question is, do you think that it, it can exist uh, a pure aesthetics of touch that doesn't remind necessarily, um, that doesn't report us to an aesthetics of vision? that is out from the, uh, you know, but because also in statues, we are not 
generally authorized to touch statues. They are yes, beautiful, yes. so you want to touch it, the but physicality, the, the temperature, mm -hmm. the, the grain, you know, uh, but you, but you cannot you can't. touch. It's, it's actually a paradox. You see something three dimensions, but it's, it, even if you photograph it, it's it, almost the same, right? right? You go to a museum to see a bidimensional retinical representation of a statue, you cannot touch it. Mm -hmm. So what's your take on uh, the, this relationship between vision and touch and their aesthetics? Well, the idea of, of wanting to touch the st statues when you see them, it's about you see them and you want to touch them. There is the touch that you want to do not necessarily, that has nothing to do with sight, but the touch that has to do with, I mean, there are, there are points where she's pulling on the, the sheets and the blankets and, and and that's not about looking at it and seeing how it's going to look or seeing what the object is. It's purely about that touch and that, this, I mean, this is, there are ways in that film that it's about returning to Odysseus. Like, that, that, the feeling, the physical nature of another person through that. But it's not connected to sight. Often, the, the, those elements are, in my films anyway, actually, you're watching as a viewer, so it's always connected to sight. Mm -hmm. But for the character, it's not. And that's, I, you know, so I'm not, I'm not showing the face looking at things. When the only times that I show the eyes, they're, it's not, you're not aware of what, the, what she's looking at, um, and you're more, connected to coming closer and closer to her eye and closer to her. That's a common trait of your thesis. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So. Mm -hmm. I would expect you have a very complicated attitude toward technology and computers. You wouldn't you tell from me not getting the sound right. <laughs> <laughs> you couldn't tell from me not getting the sound right. It's just mechanics. Yeah. 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 But um, on one hand, you, you, know, you enjoy making films. Yeah. And showing us things that you've touched that we won't be able to touch, mm -hmm. right? Um, but you clearly think that there's a, a romance to your work yes. that is um, experienced only by touching these things that were also touched thousands of years ago. Mm -hmm. Virtual reality can't do that. Yeah. Right? Uh, um, in fact, virtual reality and computers more and more will take us away from those experiences. Mm -hmm. and so I said, I'm expecting a very complicated attitude toward these things. Well, um, I mean, you, you, you make films, um, and that's a kind of mediated experience. Yeah, yes, definitely. Yeah. And you're uh, describing direct unmediated experiences. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, it, I mean, it's been an interesting struggle for me because, well, I never was a painter or a sculptor, although I've tried some of those things. Um, but I was a photographer and being in the dark room because I learned in the dark room because there wasn't any digital. Um, and, and so it was the physicality of getting the piece of paper into the chemicals and you know, and it, they didn't worry so much about the chemicals getting in and infecting your brain. But um, so you know, you just get your hands in the chemicals and, and then pull it up and let it drip. And it, that, was, that was physical. And there was a period of time when I was making installations that were actual physical spaces. So I made physical uh, uh, temples and labyrinths and things that, that had that sense of physicality to them to sort of recreate it. Films are very much hands off and especially digital editing. I did learn editing the old way too where you actually cut the film. You physically cut it and then you glue it back together to get two images together. So it was a physical process. So I come out of the physical processes it's all different now. Um, sometimes I miss all of that, but I don't get it through my art necessarily. So I, 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 I mean, I guess it is a complicated relationship because I think that that touch and actual experience is so crucial. And what I, what I began all of this with is, is that if you, if you just study something, and you don't feel it, whether it's a literal feeling or, or, or experiencing it by being there and getting that physical sense of it. And sometimes it's, physical sense can also be like the, the size of it. 
you don't necessarily have to touch it to get a physical sense of it. So sometimes it's about that experience even of walking around in that space and the, the, the sound can be the physical. And so there's lots of layers of physical. But I think that people need that experience. Virtual reality is not going to do it in the same way. Um, it, can, it can be very positive in a lot of ways for things you could not otherwise experience. But it's not the same. So I'm giving you a mediated experience here. But maybe I can encourage people to go have the real one. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know if that answered. Yeah. Can I yeah. Um, yeah, let, let's, uh, since I have one more back here, and then I'll come back to you. Yes? So what, what interested me so much in the second film was the, um, the very complex interplay between different points of view. Yes. So in one respect, we're asked to experience that space um, from a first-person point of view, mm -hmm. right? In the yes. sense that we are asked by the narrator to imagine what it would have been like for Clytemnestra to see her husband imagining him filling the space, imagining herself losing all of you know the power that she had accrued for the ten years while she while he was gone. But on the other hand, um, the images that we're seeing would of course not have been the images that she saw. Right. right? She, except for the mountain. Except for the mountain. Yeah. The walls would have been built up, obviously. Yes, it would yes. have been an, an actual palace. Yes. It would not have been the ruins, right. which is what we're seeing. Mm -hmm. so, um, and then the, the voice, the narrator's voice, is a narrator's voice. It is a third person voice yes. rather than a first person voice. Mm -hmm. right? It's not, um, I am now imagining the world. So it's, it's very interesting because you have um, a third person sort of a, a, a narration and filtering mm -hmm. that experience, but then you also have, but I'm here, so yeah. it, it's filmed on location. Mm -hmm. The walls are the walls, mm -hmm. this place that uh, could have been uh, uh, the, the tomb was, it's an actual space. Yes. Right? Um, so I, for me, that's what presents the, the real visual interest mm -hmm. uh, in, in that second film. Uh, Actually, there is a point of view shift a lot in the first film, too. It's harder probably because of the complexity of what's going on. But sometimes you're in Penelope's eyes, and sometimes you're watching her, which actually connects to Homer because she was watched by her maids, and she was spied on by the suitors, and she was watched by her son. So there are, like, there are images that are supposed to be suggesting that point of view, while there are other images like walking along that ominous kind of cyclopean wall that are more about um, what she sees would have seen. So I do like to play around with point of view. It's much more deliberate and specific, I think, in the second one. It's um, because uh, I didn't want to just retell the story, even if I changed it like I did with Penelope's Odyssey. And perhaps it was, it was about imagination. Perhaps this, perhaps that. And it was both me imagining it and thinking about her experience. And what I was thinking about, actually, the reason there's that image of the, uh, the mountain is that I've seen recreations of the, the palace room, and they, it has windows in it. So she could have looked through a window to that. And the, the mountain is, was there. And the idea of those um, clips that say that um, uh, Agamemnon would have come into the harbor and he would see those mountains. He would know that Mycenae was just right beyond those mountains. Well, those were filmed at Napoleon, which it's not in exactly the same space because of the changes in, in where the bay and the, 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 the actual edge is. But that's where he would have sailed into. Those are the mountains he would have seen. So the, bil the buildings are the same. The buildings are in ruins. but the place is, is the place of Mycenae, is the place of Agamemnon and Clytemnestra, is the space they would have seen. And although they don't think that's the tomb of Agamemnon, they, they still do connect Agamemnon and Clytemnestra and that story to that place. So yeah, it, it, 
And that's another thing where normally you might keep all in third person or all in first person. And um, I don't like those kinds of things. I got to play around with it. So, um, did you want to ask? Is there, was there someone else who had a question before I take a second question? I know we're getting close to time probably here. Yeah. So. You have a skill that I envy, and that's the ability to read Greek. Oh. <laughs> so you put up Took the years. passages. Yes. I would have enjoyed seeing the passage in Greek as well. And best of all, would have been if you had read the Greek. <laughs> Yeah. Well, um, I use Greek in a lot of my work. I do a lot of photography that has Greek text in it. Um, and I get um, similar issues from people of, oh, but I can't read the Greek. You know, and it's like, why is that there? You know, just give me the English. Um, so I, I go back and forth about that. I have, you can look on my website, andreaicearc.com, and you can see that I, I, I constantly use actually the Greek letters in my, um, in my work. Um, I almost always put English in it so that you will know also what it means. The, uh, the lament, the song that was being sung, it was originally, um, it w well, it wasn't Greek, but I took out all the recognizable parts, so it just sounds more like uh, a lament without words, just a, an emotional lament. But that was a, a Greek actress who um, has performed many Greek plays in the amphitheaters in Greece. And we were in a place called the Temple of the Winds, which is very echoey and has a wonderful sound to it. And she was just um, singing some of the parts from some of those plays. I still have all of that, and it might come back into some other one, but it wasn't for this one. So. I think we're probably at, oh, I have yeah. one more question. <laughs> I, I'd like a three-part question, but I'll move it. Um, oh, OK. It, it, uh, Phil's comment about the Greek, to tie it back to our looking ahead of the year conversation about walls, and one thing that emerges from this work is how um, hard walls are to read. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like there's this like illegibility to it. Something about the Greek, if you see it, you say, oh, that's Greek, but I can't read it. Yeah. You know what I mean? There's yep. that sense of which the wall as this tactile object that, that, that um, persists is also difficult to read. Um, so my question, though, is with the larger Greek projects, the epics, which I have an amateur love for, and I had never thought of the link between Penelope and Clymenestra as both female figures who step into these male political roles. Mm -hmm. So I have a very generic question, which is, does that, do we see that persist in other narratives that have survived from the Trojan Wars? And then could it be a sign that these, the reason the Trojan War was such a huge event in the ancient world is because it like sh shook the patriarchy a little bit? Do you know what I mean? Well, I mean, there are ways you could read it the same as when um, all the men went to war in World War II. Totally, totally. Um, the thing is that I'm not sure how much of an impact it had afterwards, you know, within a few years, which is similar mm -hmm. to World War II as well. But um, I think one of the things, there's a whole raft of feminist scholarship, feminist reinterpretations of the classics. These did not exist when I was a classic student. And I rediscovered them. I was on sabbatical in Greece, and I was there for, for four months just reading and filming and photographing. And that was my job to do for that four months. And it was pretty wonderful. And I found all this feminist scholarship on reinterpretations of this is all in some of these texts. It's not as if we have to f make it up. Um, that's why it was so important to me to get the words out of Homer. Is, is to and and to make sure I was translating them so I could dig into what he actually said, if, even though he is not really a one person probably. But um, but it's I think that there's a more complex um, understanding we could have of the role of women in ancient Greek culture. Certainly, there were a lot of ways that, you know they couldn't vote, they couldn't own property. There's a, you know there are a lot of things that are. Yes, we know. But the key thing to me about Penelope and Odysseus's uh, relationship is that it's something that in, in Homer's words, it, it's a word called homophrosine, in which they're like-minded. And she is just as crafty 
as he is. She deceives people constantly, just like he did. She, she uses guile to get her way. Um, she's very, very intelligent, and that's what gets him through a lot of what, but she's a bit more faithful to him than he is to her, but, um, but she also did it through using her brain. And that's in Homer, that's in that story. You know, she, she would weave and then unravel it at night because she said, when I'm done with this shroud, then I'll marry one of you. But she never finished it because she would unravel it at night to leave. You know, somebody spied on her and told on her. But so these sorts of things, it's there in the past. And that's why I think it's, it's particularly important for these reinterpretations to happen because it's not as if we're just coming up with our interpretations of something that isn't in the text already. Some people do that, I know, but I'm really intrigued at the ones that are already there. No, and there's there's quite a few of them actually. I'm not done yet. <laughs> so. All right, we're out of time. Let's thank Andrew. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you all for coming out this afternoon. Please uh, watch for our posters and come back to see John Matsui in November. Um, have a great day.